Well, this was um, quite a performance. I don't think I'll be able to match it. I'll try at least to uh, respond to some of the issues that you've raised. It's um, a great thrill to be here among so many uh, smart, wonderful people from the LSE. It makes me even regret having chosen to go to Oxford. <laughs> but um, I think uh, Professor Cox uh, raised uh, a number of issues in a, in a fascinating manner. And uh, I think I'm a very poor choice to respond for the main reason that I, t I tend to agree with most of what he said. Uh, so I, I guess I would either have to, uh, to fake um, sort of a contrarianism, uh, which would not be very honest, or just the most of the more honest choice, uh, try to say what I think about what he said, which um, I think was a, a fascinating starting point of trying to reflect on global order and the phenomena of power at a global level. Um, in a way, it's interesting because uh, Professor Cox is, uh, is a Brit, uh, we are Greeks. It's in a way like two empires uh, discussing with each other. Well, Greece has been an empire longer uh, time ago than Britain. And I remember when I was in the, in the UK, um, we used to have this uh, uh, this puzzle of how can a country that uh, had, had ruled the world as an empire for centuries not be able to make uh, hot and cold water run out of the same tab. Uh, I never came across uh, solving that, but I think it has been solved by technology now in the UK. But uh, what I wanted to say, actually, is uh, Professor Cox pointed to that, um, and I very much share his skepticism uh, and his sort of... Um, uh, irreverent critique of many uh, simplifying theories, uh, kind of pocketbook, airport, IR, um, uh, uh, literature that we tend to find. Um, I remember uh, in the late 90s there was um, a very respectable, very intelligent columnist of the New York Times wrote the theory, the sort of what I would call the McDonald, I think he called it the McDonald theory of democracy, saying that uh, countries that, that have a McDonald, uh, McDonald's store do not wage war against each other. It's in a way it was a, a kind of evolved or degenerate version of Kant's perpetual peace theory. And then uh, a few months after he wrote that, uh, uh, Belgrade uh, was being bombed and Belgrade had a McDonald's. So that goes with here. And I also remember the, uh, Professor Cox mentioned uh, Paul Kennedy, Rise and Fall of Great Powers, spent uh, uh, three wonderful weeks back in 1995 in a reading party at the Chalet in the Alps studying uh, the Rise and Fall of Great Powers, uh, which actually predicted that the 21st century would be the century of Japan. Uh, we were already in the third year of Japan's liquidity trap, which was going to last over two decades. So much for... Um, the ability of historians in predicting the future. Uh, however, I think what is interesting there, and Professor Cox has helped us come close to, to the real question of how can we actually tell the difference between what appears as a long-term trend, one that is able, that has the dynamics to, to shape uh, future things to come, for the next decades or even for the next century. How can we tell that, the difference between that, and something that is just a short-term um, fluctuation, uh, a blip in the future historian's radar screen? So in a way, the idea that the BRICS were rising to a point of actually being able to challenge Western hegemony uh, was an idea that was the result of, as we probably now know, um, a certain uh, extremely uh, favorable conjuncture. High commodity prices, um, the fact that the Chinese economy was at the fast, very high, high fast growth track before uh, coming close to becoming, from an economy of exporters and savers, more like a more balanced economy of people who tend to spend more um, and, um, 
and uh, uh, act as consumers, not just savers. Uh, or in the case of Russia, the overdependence on oil, which, whose results we're now uh, seeing. So it seems to me that what Professor Cox has helped us look for is, and he mentioned that in fact, is the actual uh, reasons or the actual dynamics behind global power. Um, and the way he posed the question, what makes power, allows me to try and improvise uh, on some of the elements that might help us kind of um, sketch the prerequisites of a more lasting version of power. It seems to me that the first element is domestic, uh, enduring domestic institutions. Um, and uh, the fabulous book by uh, Ajemoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, point out, points out the importance of both economic and political institutions. Um, it also seems to be a case of the ability to exercise control over global institutions. That is, the ability to set the rules under which global interdependence evolves. The ability to shape the governance of globalization. Um, and that also includes, as we know after 2008, the responsibility for seeing the failures of this global financial interdependence as a result of a very deficient structure of governance uh, of that financial interdependence. And we, we saw that at the global level. We saw it mainly in the US, and we've seen it more dramatically uh, in the European Union and the Eurozone. The other thing that relates to, to, to the previous one is having actually a set of exportable institutions, institutions that can serve as focal points for institutional emulation at a global level. These institutions are economic, political, corporate, and there, if you come to question which are the countries that serve as sources of institutional emulation, you would not find too many of them outside what you have mentioned as the sort of the Western bloc. I mean, you can find many alternatives, and you can find many niche players in the global competition game, but the main exporters of institution, institutions are um, the, the, uh, the group of countries that uh, Professor Cox has outlined. Then, of course, uh, these institutions have to do with solving collective action, global collective action problems, and you um, superbly ended with underlining the importance of engendering a global cooperation that is um, positive sum, that is a coordination that aims towards mutual benefit outcomes, uh, and thus overcoming conflict uh, and co global competition uh, through engendering the benefits and nurturing the benefits and sustaining the benefits of cooperation. Um, and it, it seems to me that the institutions that have the greatest potential for endurance are those that have kind of uh, the, the tendency to, uh, 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 to be downloaded by, by other countries or by other groups. And the, the countries that are those that are able to shape the global power balances are those that are able to upload their institutions or the standard operating procedures. And finally, what Professor Cox has also uh, mentioned is having a sort of hegemonic discourse. You can find many new players in the global power block and what some have called the multipolar world or a pluripolar world, but not all of them. In fact, very few of them are able to command a sort of hegemonic discourse, uh, have a set of values, a system of values that can be globally shared or emulated. And uh, of course, we live in a pluralistic world but pluralism, in a way, is a value system of the Western world as well. I hope I'm not sounding, sounding very uh, uh, occidentalist uh, here or orientalist in, in the reverse. Um, just to try to follow up on the Popper Cox falsifiability test, um, your resilience after the crisis. You mentioned the global crisis 2008. 
The U.S. has been immensely, has proven resilient uh, in the face of a crisis which it shared a huge responsibility uh, for causing, um, along with a certain brand of economists who uh, serve only to make the profession of astrologists uh, sound dignified. Um, and uh, you have rightfully pointed out one of the main sources of that power, and I would say also sources of resilience and flexibility in overcoming crisis, and that is the power of controlling your currency. And I'm only tempted to think or to try to um, allow my imagination to wander in lands that uh, have sort of utopian characteristics of how better the Eurozone, our Eurozone, would have been if it has been able to tap on the benefits of a real uh, global reserve currency, such as the US dollar. Uh, that is, the benefits of a, of a deep and liquid uh, uh, money and capital market by issuing its own treasuries or its own bonds. And, um, and through these, be able not only to confront the collective problem that is now crippling the Eurozone economy and is causing enormous fracture and animosity inside Europe and is the recipe for toxic, poisonous politics, apart from the terrible socioeconomic decline that we are witnessing and the fragmentation of the Eurozone, um, but also finance the exit of the Eurozone economy from the crisis through a a brave boost of investment funded through a common, shared, uh, mutualized Eurobond instrument. Um, and I'd like to end up with a note of caution on Europe. Um, it has been said that, and I think it was rightfully said, uh, that uh, Europe controls 7% of global population, 25% of global GDP, and about 50% of global social spending. And, uh, of course, the welfare state is a part and parcel of the European model and the European way of life. Uh, but it also has to be economically sustainable. And I believe the greatest challenge that Europe faces today is the longer-term challenge. The long-term challenge that has to do with its inability to overcome its vicious demographics. The problem of aging is heavier in Europe than it is in the US. It is heavier in older Europe than it is in younger Europe, and it's heavier in countries that, uh, or it rather has much heavier implications in countries that haven't reformed their pension systems as much as others have. And of course, the big questions regarding the ability of Europe to sustain its model in an aging society mature service-based economies where, in addition to that, the cost of cleaning up the environment is, will be very important. Uh, and when some of the instruments through which the European economy grew will not be around, for good reasons, financial uh, boost that we have seen in the previous decades uh, will be very significantly tamed, for one thing. But the most important element, I believe, at least from this corner of Europe, um, in allowing the European and the Eurozone economy to grow in a cohesive way and in a sustainable way is, will be its ability to resolve the uh, problems of collective coexistence under a single currency. Uh, and the only way forward to that, and let me finish with this expression of my deformation professionnelle, is to move to a real economic union inside the monetary union with real full-fledged political institutions, uh, significant structures of mutualization, and also uh, viable and, and rigorous mechanisms of discipline and national policy responsibility. This is the only way forward, the way I see it, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity.